I'm Esther Sullivan. Thank you for having me here. I don't host a comedy show. I'm an academic who made this lineup. I don't know. <laughs> I want to talk um, a little bit about housing. Right now, there is no state in the United States where an individual working full time for minimum wage can afford fair market rent for a one bedroom apartment. In fact, Affordable housing is so hard to find that you'll actually spend less of your income if you can afford to buy a house rather than rent. This is something that mobile homeowners have already figured out. Today, a manufactured home, a mobile home, costs less than half per square foot than a site-built conventional home. And 18 million Americans are already in on the secret. They've achieved the American dream of home ownership, and they've done it on a budget. In fact, mobile homes today provide this country's largest source of unsubsidized affordable housing. 71% of all new homes sold under $125,000 are mobile homes, manufactured homes. But there's a problem because one of our largest sources of affordable housing is also one of our most insecure. As I demonstrate in my new book, Manufactured Insecurity, mobile homes are insecure for two reasons, which are like two trains headed right for each other. The first reason isn't the home itself, it's the land where these homes sit. About a third of mobile homes are located in mobile home parks where residents own the home but rent the land under the home. Now this is actually part of what makes this form of housing so affordable, but it also means that these homeowners can be evicted with as little as 30 days notice in many states if that park owner decides to sell or redevelop the mobile home park. The second reason that these mobile homes are so insecure is that they're often invisible. For over a century, planning and zoning laws have required that mobile home parks be walled in, fenced off, or in the language of city planners, visually screened from view. These laws restrict the development of mobile home parks near conventional housing, and as a result, mobile home parks are disproportionately located in commercial and industrial areas. So now you can see those two trains about to collide, right? when you have communities of homeowners that are isolated onto commercial properties owned by a third party, they're the first victims of urban growth. When a big box store is looking for a place to build, a mobile home park is an easy target. When parks are redeveloped, home owning residents are evicted, again, with as little as 30 days notice in many states, and they're they're removed from the places where many of these households have lived for decades. And entire communities get dismantled. And this is not a one-off incident. This is happening at an alarming rate right now. As a sociologist, I wanted to document the impact of these mass evictions and the implications for low-income households that are trying to access and hold on to housing they can afford. So beginning in 2012, I rented a mobile home inside closing mobile home parks, first in Florida and then in Texas. Those are the two states with the largest mobile home populations. I moved in and I lived beside neighbors for 17 consecutive months before we were evicted and then I followed these households uh, over the next six months after the evictions took place. These are some of the things I learned. First, the term mobile home is a complete misnomer. A mobile home is not an RV, it's not a camper, it's not intended to be mobile once it's initially transported from the factory and installed. In the closing parks where I lived, Lucky residents drained entire savings to move their homes, sometimes just across town, to salvage their investment in their homes. These moves can cost up to $15,000. And those were the lucky residents. Unlucky residents lost everything. Their homes weren't structurally sound for relocation, and they were forced to abandon them. These residents were real people, like my neighbor Stella. Stella was... Uh, 
blind and completely homebound, but at the age of 89, she prided herself on being able to live independently. Her knowing every corner of her mobile home and her cheap rent in her mobile home park had allowed her to do that. It made that independence possible. She'd paid off the home years ago, but when the park closed, she couldn't afford to move it on her $790 monthly social security check. In the end, Stella lost her prized independence and her home of 20 years. She was forced to move into a guest room, an office in her son's apartment. Randall lived two streets over from Stella. He meticulously maintained his mobile home. It was the first home he'd ever owned. But Randall learned this home was not structurally sound for relocation. He frantically searched for affordable housing nearby and found nothing, even after months of searching. On the final day before our park closed, Randall transitioned from homeowner to homeless, and to this day, he sleeps on a park bench about a mile from where his home once was. Randall and Stella are just two of about 200 evicted mobile home park residents that I met over those two years. And while everybody's story is a little different, the common reality is that these mobile home park closures create a cycle of housing instability that extended well beyond these moments of eviction. Zoning these communities into invisibility, it creates this kind of housing instability. But more than, that, than just that, it creates social vulnerability because it's difficult to care about the things that we don't see. So addressing this housing problem means first working to change the very regulations that keep mobile home parks invisible. We need to push for new planning and zoning policies that better integrate different forms of housing into the fabric of our residential communities. But more than anything, we need to address that underlying land ownership issue, that issue in mobile home parks where residents are living on property that they don't own. And it turns out that we actually have a pretty good model to follow, which is the condo model, right? Where you own your unit, but you hold the condo assets collectively. The same model is being tried in parks across the country, and it's working. In about 200 parks, nonprofit groups like Rock USA have helped residents get a loan collectively so that they can collectively purchase their park and run it themselves. And residents in these parks report seeing immediate improvements in the maintenance, quality, and most of all, in the stability of their communities. Mobile home parks show us the value of home ownership for all income levels. Mobile home parks even show us how we might imagine new collective forms of property ownership that can help us stabilize the affordable housing that we already have. And most importantly, parks show us the benefit of housing stability and security for everyone. Thank you.